This is 10,000 ringgit and this is 1 million. And this is 115 billion ringgit Malaysia. What if all of this money enter into Malaysia? Will this be a reality? Or will this happen again? So, how would this 115 billion ringgit investment affect you and me as Malaysians? And how can we benefit from it? Well, to give you a little bit more context, this 115 billion ringgit investment is the total amount invested over the past three years to build data centers all around Malaysia. What exactly is a data center? Well, before I answer that, take a moment and look around your room and count how many electronic devices that you have. I bet most of you have at least two. Your phone that you're holding right now, your laptop, tablet, or maybe even a smartwatch. All of these devices have one thing in common. They collect your data. I mean, yeah, privacy is becoming a thing of the past now, but have you ever wondered where all these data is stored? Like the photos on your phone or your gaming data? Where do they all go? If you answer iCloud or Google Drive, you're spot on. Now, imagine everyone in this world using these services to the point that the amount of data generated globally every day is about 16 terabytes, equivalent to storing 16 million high-quality photos every single day. So, how do companies like Apple and Google store all these data? Do they have their own version of cloud or drive? Well, their cloud is actually a network of data centers, a massive library where all your data is securely stored. And the demand for these data centers has skyrocketed since COVID-19 as the internet usage has surged by many, many folds. I mean, just look around. People are using e-wallets more frequently to pay for food. And in Malaysia alone, 73% of us shop via social media, far above the global average of 44%. And the rise of AI with tools like ChatGPT has further accelerated this trend. Even this is AI generated. Anyways, this is exactly why back in 2018, you didn't see much hype around data centers in Malaysia. But now, they are everywhere. Amazon, Nvidia, Google and Microsoft. These advanced technologies aren't based in Malaysia, right? Even our 5G coverage is still lagging behind a lot of countries at only 27% at the end of last year, as opposed to Singapore's 54% and Thailand's 46%. And to add to that, Singapore announced its digital bank license in 2019, years before ours in 2022. My point is, Malaysia is somewhat slower in terms of digitalization compared to its peers. Yet, these big companies are all still here. So, why Malaysia? Well, that's because Malaysia meets the three vital criteria for data center construction. Land, power, and water. And before the AI boom, all these companies favoured places like Hong Kong and our neighbour Singapore for data centres, given their status as global financial hubs. However, they have one problem in common, limited land and resources for power and water. Data centers typically require about 10,000 to 150,000 square meters of land, and one 10,000 square meter space alone is about 1.4 times the size of a standard football field. Now, imagine how much land is needed if the demand grows bigger and bigger over time. On top of that, data centers consume massive amounts of electricity and also water. A study by the EU in 2020 shows that the amount of electricity their data center uses is actually more than several countries and the heat that it produces needs to be cooled by cooling systems which also requires a lot of energy which will then generate more heat again basically an endless cycle of heat generation and consumption you see Malaysia is around 480 times bigger than Singapore and you know lah they need us for everything even water supply and as you can see, they are still struggling with these challenges. In 2019, they issued a moratorium on data center construction, which froze all the data center constructions due to its concerns over land scarcity and sustainability, since they produce so much more carbons that are over 200 times greater than the percentage of its land area. Although in 2022, they lifted the moratorium temporarily and opened up 300 megawatts for data centers. I mean, you know, to earn more money, ma. But because of these three-year freeze in Singapore, the data centers have found their new home outside of Singapore. Guess where they turned to? Malaysia. It became the top country in Southeast Asia for data center investments 
and this market is forecasted to surge by 72% in 6 years time, surpassing Southeast Asia's overall growth rate of 47%. Johor alone with more than 1.6 gigawatts of total power supply has attracted 50 data center investments over the last 2 years and it is all thanks to our abundant land in the North and South Peninsula, not in KL City Centre of course, but places like Cyberjaya and Johor have become prime locations for data centers. Our electricity tariffs are lowered compared to other ASEAN countries as we only charge around 20 to 34 cents per kilowatt hour, while Thailand and Singapore's electricity are actually priced at 51 cents per kilowatt hour and 1 ringgit and 11 cents per kilowatt hour respectively. And to make it even better, the 100% tax exemption to eligible data centers and cloud business investments has also helped to attract a lot more investments as well. So, huge props to Miti for encouraging this growth. And not only that, our friendly policies like the Green Lane Pathway also enable new data centers to secure power in as little as 12 months compared to the typical 36 to 48 months. And faster usually means better business profits for the investors. And last but not least, our nation's commitment to green energy, or usually they call it ESG, has been a key factor in attracting big tech companies. These companies are increasingly driven by the need to meet global sustainability standards and reduce their environmental impact, making Malaysia an appealing destination for their data center investments. And that's because when we compare ourselves to the strongest ASEAN competitor, Indonesia, we stand out in green energy use. In 2023, Malaysia's renewable energy mix was at 27% compared to Indonesia's 13% and our government aims to increase this to 40% by 2035 and 70% by 2050. Quick pause, this video took me and my team a really really long time to produce. I mean, just see all this research paper here. So, if you'd like to support this channel, please subscribe and please give a thumbs up down below. And if you're interested in investing in this growing sector, you can sign up with one of the best and cheapest brokerages in the world, Interactive Brokers, using my link down below. Alright, let's get back to the video. Anyways, speaking of data centers and the AI search, there's also one industry that is tied closely to it that we have to mention, the semiconductor industry, which is also another industry that is booming here right now. I offer our nation as the most neutral and non-aligned location for semiconductor production to help build a more secure and resilient global semiconductor supply chain. And in Malaysia, we have appeared as a significant player in chip manufacturing, accounting for about 13% of global backend manufacturing. And this industry contributes to an estimated 25% of our GDP, where 40% of our exports come from this sector as well. The semiconductor is essentially a chip that is like a hut to your phone or your laptop, making sure your devices work as intended. And behind the production of each semiconductor chip lies a complex supply chain, which I'll simplify for you today. It all starts with the design, where international firms such as ARM and also Intel create the architecture and design of the chip. And these chips' designs will be created on a flat piece of wafer made of silicon, by manufacturing companies such as China's TSMC, oops, I mean Taiwan's TSMC, which is now one of the most important companies in the world. And once the chips are made, they move to Malaysia, the hidden semiconductor powerhouse, specializing in testing, packaging, and assembly. Companies here will then carry out testing to make sure the chips work perfectly before they are sent to manufacturers all around the world, where they are then integrated into devices like your smartphone or laptops. And our Silicon Valley of the East, Penang, which represents 80% of Malaysia's semicon sales, has attracted a record-breaking $12.8 billion, about 60 billion ringgit in foreign direct investments in 2023 alone, which surpassed the total amount from the previous seven years combined. So, why else again? Is this a coincidence that everyone started to notice Malaysia right now? Well, before we jump right into the answer, let me update you a little bit about what happened in the world that caused a lot of big companies to move their manufacturing outside of the US and China. So, 
our two big brothers, China and the US have been in a little fight since 2018 and this has impacted the global supply chain, especially the electronics and semiconductors manufacturing sector. The trade war started because in recent years, China rapidly expanded its semiconductor industry and working aggressively to develop more advanced semicon technologies like those used in artificial intelligence and also 5G. And the US has been concerned about China's dominance, especially in the technology race since the Chinese are beating them to become the world's top technology superpower in electric batteries, 5G, 6G and even more. And therefore, the US has imposed tariffs or in layman's terms, taxes on Chinese goods, making it more expensive for companies like Apple and Google to manufacture their products and have no choice but to move the production to other countries like Malaysia. And with that, Penang became the go-to place for these companies. Penang's Bayan Lepas Free Trade Zone, the home to Malaysia's main electrical and electronic manufacturing hubs which was established back in 1972, has attracted international giants like Intel, Bosch and also HP. And that helped create a strong ecosystem supporting the growth of local suppliers or service providers in the semiconductor industry. Take Vitrox Corporation for instance, a Malaysian company that has emerged as a global leader in automated vision inspection systems, providing essential testing solutions for semiconductor manufacturing. And similarly, Inari Amatron has grown into one of Malaysia's leading outsourced semiconductor assembly and test OSAT providers, serving major global semiconductor companies like Broadcom, a US tech company with over 750 billion US dollars market cap. As such, Penang now has solidified its position as a key player in the global semiconductor supply chain. So, given all these new investments, could the Malaysian ringgit strengthen to 2 ringgit for one sing dollar again? And will we live to see Singaporeans coming in to work in Malaysia? Hmm, perhaps we can consider what our Deputy Minister of Miti, YB Liu Chintong, recently said. And before you ask, uh, the first search was back when Toon Dr. Mahathir ruled the country back in the 1980s and he has helped Malaysia to shift from being primarily an agricultural economy to becoming a major industrial hub. And let's not forget our pride as well, the Petronas Twin Towers which attracted millions of tourists every single year along with the Kuala Lumpur International Airport KIA and also the North-South Highway which makes travelling between states and cities much more easier. These were all significant infrastructure developments under Toon Dr. Mahathir's tenure and without them, Malaysia won't be where we are today. And can you imagine the EPF dividend to be at 8.5%? If you were working back in the 1980s, you probably can relate to that, while we today only get a little 5.5%. So, what happened to Wawasan 2020? Why has our wage growth been limited to just 3 to 4% per year, barely outpacing inflation at 2%, which even spiked to 4.7% in September 2022? You see, in regions like Penang and Selangor, inflation is even higher at around 3%. And with property prices growing by 6 to 8% annually, many Malaysians still can't afford a house. Well, we all know the answer, right? What's the answer? Politics, lah. And with all these new ambitions by the government, can we really expect a second economic surge? Well, Firstly, these new investments in Malaysia are expected to create around 2,300 jobs as mentioned by our Prime Minister. And this increase in job opportunities can help reduce the unemployment rate further and hopefully raise the income of the average Malaysian household. And with more disposable income, Malaysians will likely spend more which in turn could boost the overall economy. And with increased foreign direct investment FDI, hopefully the Malaysian ringgit will strengthen further against other currencies, making our purchasing power stronger and we can feel less pain in buying imported products like the iPhone and making it cheaper for us to travel all around the world. More exports from these investments, especially the manufacturing of semiconductor chips, could also boost Malaysia's trade income, which means more improvements in infrastructure all across the country. And please, no more sinkholes. However, 
every rose has its thorn, and the flooding of the investments mostly in the data center could result in problems like a widespread water shortage, rising energy prices, and higher carbon footprints with an extensive amount of electricity and water required. And according to a study, a data center with a capacity of 100 megawatts uses about 1.1 million gallons of water per day for cooling purposes. And this is the equivalent of daily water usage for a city of 10,000 people. And what's even worse, our nation's water regulator even said that the country could face widespread water shortages in the next five years due to climate change, wastage, and aging infrastructure. And I believe that most of us in the Klang Valley understand the frustrations of having no water, right? Come on, Ayes Lango. And let's not forget about the income inequality between the states as the current investments are heavily concentrated in regions like Penang, Cyberjaya and also Johor and this could worsen regional gaps leaving other states like Kedah, Pera and Kelantan lagging behind in terms of economic growth and development resulting in lower employment and lower income. And remember how I mentioned that increasing job opportunities will lead to higher disposable income which will then boost the economy? Well, this could also result in inflation as those in the IT and related industries who now earn more will have more money to spend. But what about those who aren't in that industry? They are still earning peanuts and struggling to sustain a more expensive lifestyle. And that's why, as I've mentioned repeatedly, the government must increase the minimum wage and revise it annually to reduce income inequality all across the board. And that's it. What do you think about the new investment in Malaysia? Do you agree that it will change Malaysia for the better and lead us to a second surge in the economy? Let us know what you think in the comments down below.